Energy independence has been promised by numerous American presidents going all the way back to Richard Nixon. And in the name of achieving American energy independence, numerous projects have been undertaken, most of them uh, counterproductive at best, from sin fuels to ethanol subsidies uh, to Secretary Chu's investments in green energy. All of these things have led more or less into um, dead ends. But while all of these quote-unquote investments, all of these schemes have been, have been carried out over the past 40 to 45 years, something else has been going on. And that is developments which are now culminating in the real possibility that the United States will achieve energy independence and within a relatively short period of time. The driving force behind that is, of course, something with which you all are, are familiar, and that is the shale revolution. Our ability to get at resources, oil and natural gas, which have been there all along. What has not been there until very recently was, uh, was the technology to extract those resources. That has come along quite unexpectedly, and that is dramatically reshuffling America's, not only America's energy deck, but the deck of cards with which the entire world is going to be playing the energy game in the decades to come. Shale resources, uh, let me get our laser thing here and see. This is not the right one. Well, it always helps to have the right one. Let's go. Okay. Mm -hmm. okay. Ah, here we go. Um, in the United States, we have shale formations spread about the country. Uh, the most uh, prominent of which, of course, is the Marcellus Shale, located in New York, Pennsylvania, the southern tier of New York, Pennsylvania, or West Virginia, eastern Ohio, eastern Kentucky, a slither of both Maryland and Virginia. We also have the very prominent Bakken Shale Formation located in western North Dakota and eastern Montana, along with down in Texas, the Barnett Formation right around in North Texas near Fort, actually underneath the city of Fort Worth, as well as the Eagle Ford Formation down here in southeastern Texas. In addition to which, there are other shale formations, the Utica Shale Formation in eastern Ohio, which spreads east into Pennsylvania into parts of uh, the southern tier of New York, and a bunch of lesser shale formations that are around the country that don't receive the attention that they, that they deserve, but w what, which will, in the years to come, be new sources of energy. They are to be found in such places as Oklahoma, Kansas, northern Louisiana, Arkansas, Indiana, the southern peninsula of Michigan, with one notable exception, by the way, the city of Detroit, nothing, nada. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah the, the, motor, the motor city just can't catch a break. They're also to be found in, in Indiana and even Alabama. There's a, there's a very uh, promising shale formation that stretches from central Alabama up through northeastern Georgia into Tennessee. Some of these shale formations are primarily sources of natural gas. Others are shale formations are sources of both natural gas and oil. Together, all of these shale formations have brought about a revolution in how we are going to uh, extract energy and put it to our purposes, both in, in our personal lives as well as in the economy of the country. In addition to the shale formations that we have around the country and our ability to get at them through the twin technologies of hydraulic fracturing, also known as fracking, and horizontal drilling, we have more conventional sources of energy in this country. They are to be found 
in the Gulf of Mexico, along the mid-Atlantic to southeastern Atlantic coast, a bit here in the Pacific area in Alaska, and more recently, uh, we are just beginning to go after uh, substantial oil resources in the Chukchi and Beaufort sea, Beaufort sea area, area up here in northern Alaska. The potential there, by the way, is thought to be around 400,000 barrels of oil a day. And Shell Oil is, has just recently uh, crossed this run as many bureaucratic hurdles as you can possibly imagine, but is now apparently on the verge of finally being able to explore the riches of the oil riches of that area. Let's just take one, one, one example of the kinds of things that are going on. In North Dakota here, in the Bakken Shale Formation, the production of oil has more than doubled in the past two years. Fifteen billion dollars of oil was produced in that area in the, in, the, in the last year that did not have to go abroad. Think of that. Domestic production of oil means that billions and billions of dollars will stay in the United States and not have to go abroad in, to uh, governments which are uh, somewhat un undesirable at, at, in many cases. So what you're, what you're seeing here is a dramatic change in our domestic uh, energy picture. This is combined with other resources that we have. We've all heard the expression that the United States is the Saudi Arabia of coal. Well, it turns out that we're the Saudi Arabia of coal, oil, and natural gas. We are, in fact, the Saudi Arabia of fossil fuels. We have them in abundance in more traditional formations, and we have them in shale formations. All of this portends an economic recovery in the United States, particularly in parts of the United States, which would have been unimaginable only a few years ago. We're all familiar with the term the Rust Belt. Well, guess what? In parts of the Rust Belt, the rust is going to disappear, and factories are going to come back. Indeed, they already are. Why? Because access to affordable energy makes manufacturing a much more attractive prospect uh, in the, domestically than having something manufactured in China and bringing it over here. We're going to get, be going to China uh, very shortly, and you're going to see what uh, process, what developments are going on in China, which will actually even make domestic production, domestic manufacturing in the United States an even better paying prop proposition than, than it is now. In sum, we have an economic rebound, that, is, that we have an energy rebound, predicted by absolutely no one, but which is well underway which will make something that was a pipe dream and nothing but a worthless political pr promise for decades and decades to come into what is emerging as a real reality with far-reaching consequences. Now, the United States is not the only country in the world with shale deposits. They can be found in France. They can be found in England, in Poland, in the Czech Republic, in Bulgaria. They are strongly suspected to be, to be available in Russia, and we'll come to that in a few minutes, as well as in China, and quite possibly also, also in Argentina and other parts of South America. But what is unique about the American deposits of uh, oil and shale gas is that, and we can be very thankful for this, most of them are located on private land. And there's something very, that's right. And there's something very unique about uh, American, uh, America's judicial system. You know, most of us hate it, of course, because of all the suits and the lawyers getting rich and everybody suing everybody else. Okay, it's very ugly, but there's one actually slither of goodness in it, and that is we have something called minimal rights. That a rural landowner not only owns the land, it can plant crops or, or herd cattle on that land, but the rural landowner also owns what is beneath. 
And that therein lies a huge difference between what we are able to do in this country with the resources at our disposal and what, 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 is, what other countries in Europe. A French farmer has absolutely no incentive whatsoever to uh, allow uh, drilling and fracking on his land for the very simple reason is he doesn't have any rights to it. It's going to be a government thing. So this is, this is uh, in the US, you have a dynamic uh, that, uh, th that is quite, quite unique in the world. And again, we can be very glad all of it's on private land. I can assure you of one thing. If all the oil and shale gas resources in the United States were on federal land, as sadly some of them are, uh, all of the boom that we are seeing in North Dakota, Pennsylvania, Wisconsin, Southeast Texas would never have taken place. The people would still be involved in getting permits for this, that, and the other. They would have to go to Washington to get permission to do what they could otherwise do at the local state level in cooperation with the state environmental agencies. So this is the new situation that has arisen in the past several years. But we are not an island, and I think it's the best thing for us to do is take a look at our energy situation and our emerging uh, energy independence, if in fact we, we could reach that, and put that in a global context. Because regardless of what we do in this country, other things are going to be going on around the world that will bear directly on us. And the perspective I'm going to use this morning is a little bit different than what you might be expecting. We're not going to be talking about the number of barrels produced or the number of cubic feet of, of, of natural gas. We don't want to get into a numbers game because, quite frankly, nobody knows how much is there. Whoops. Did we? We lost the world. The world's back. That's, okay. Uh, no, no doubt Al Gore is doing. Uh, but be that as a but, there is one underlying trend in the world today which does not get the attention that it should which is going to bear directly on geopolitical realities uh, in the decades to come. And that is a demographic transformation uh, of historic and unprecedented dimensions. The world's population right now is roughly 7 billion. It is expected to rise to, to somewhere between 9 and 10 billion by roughly mid-century, probably sometime shortly before then. At that point, it will level off for a short period of time and then plummet. And it will plummet across the globe. Indeed, it is already plummeting in many areas of the world. Demographers are already speaking of net mortality societies, the rise of net mortality societies, meaning that more people die than are born, meaning also that societies are going to be uh, faced with a problem of a declining population. There were many bad things happened in the year 1968. Uh, life is too short to enumerate them. One of them was a book published by Paul Ehrlich called The Population Bomb in which he said and predicted with great confidence that the world was, was facing a population explosion. And that explosion would deplete natural resources, lead to famine, and God knows how many other horrible things. Mr. Ehrlich had it exactly wrong, because beginning about the time that his book came out, global fertility rates began to fall, and they are falling even more rapidly with each passing year. Going over here to Europe, there we go, from Portugal spreading across the entire continent of Europe, across all of Russia to the far east, and all of the area encompassing that, birth rates are all below replacement le level of 2.1 children. And in most cases, they are far below the replacement level of 2.1. The same trend is underway in Latin America, 
from the Rio Grande all the way to the tip of South Africa, and is even underway in parts of the Islamic world. We have a vision of Islam and children everywhere. Well, not necessarily. Uh, birth rates are declining in Morocco, in Libya, and they have been declining in Iran for 35 years. The Iranians apparently are not all that enthusiastic about raising their children under, under the Ayatollahs. Birth rates are also rapidly declining in China, we'll get to that in a moment, in Japan, and in Korea. So rather than facing a demographic, a, a demographic explosion, we are looking at a demographic implosion. The population of the Earth is going to go down beginning mid-century, and it's going to go down rapidly. Interesting from an energy standpoint is that we will have ever more amounts, amounts of energy from fossil fuels, from nuclear, and, and elsewhere. But it's going to be supporting, beginning in mid-century, a declining global population. This is a dynamic that we have never seen before. Now, also, the, the decline in, in, in global population, I said, was unprecedented. Now, throughout human history, there have been periods in which mostly as a result of communicable diseases, we have had massive die-offs of population. Think of the Black Death in Europe, which began in 1347. It was horrendous. The population of Europe was, was reduced anywhere by from one-third to two-thirds, but it was largely limited uh, in, in scope. What we are facing now here is global in scope, with a couple of exceptions, and I'll get to those in a minute. And let's go to the one country which is both a huge energy producer but is a world leader in demographic collapse, and that is Russia. The Russian birth rate is officially put at roughly 1.4, okay? Uh, that figure includes everyone who lives in Russia, including non-Russians, and indeed, the birth rate of non-Russians, the vast majority of whom are, um, uh, are Muslims, uh, is, is, is higher. So the actual birth rate of Russians is probably, no one knows for sure, around 1.3. Adding to Russia's demogra to, to the extremely low fertility rates in Russia are a couple of other developments. First of all, plummeting life expectancy. Yes, unlike many other countries in the world, life expectancy in Russia for males and females is dropping and dropping rapidly. For males, it is just over 60 years of age, and for females, it is, has dropped below 70 and is continuing to fall. Several factors for the, uh, are involved in this. They include rampant alcoholism, a healthcare system that has not uh, recovered from the Soviet era, whether we will ever recover from Obamacare is another question. Um, uh, widespread uh, a drug culture that uh, is actually far more serious than our own, that is leading to the spread of HIV throughout the country. Tuberculosis is also rampant in Russia. In, in addition to all of those problems, Russia is exporting people. Some three million Russians the vast majority of them young, have left the country just in the past seven or eight years. They continue to come. Walk around New York or walk around Washington, where I live, and you will hear people speaking Russian. Many of them are people who left Russia and have absolutely no intention of going back because the oligarchy uh, that runs the country has little to offer them, and they are seeking their opportunities elsewhere. Not only is Russia losing, losing population, oddly, despite its enormous uh, mineral wealth and oil and natural gas wealth, it's also losing money. Capital flight is rampant in Russia. $83 billion left Russia last year and was deposited in the usual suspects, Swiss bank accounts, you know, hedge fund managers in New York, God knows where, but $83 billion left Russia in 2011. 
For the first six months of 2012, that figure is $96 billion. This is an enormous flight of both capital and people from Russia, a vote of no confidence in Russia's future on the part of both those who benefit from, those, from that, namely the people who earn the money, as well as the younger people who look at that and say, well, if you're not in Putin's entourage, if you're not part of the oligarchical structure, there is no future for you here, and I will then go elsewhere. Now, with that demographic trend for Russia in mind, let's take a look at Russia's energy, okay? There, the situation is somewhat mixed. Russia's uh, oil resources over here, there we go, o over here in the far, uh, far East are uh, depleting. They're extremely e expensive to extract and uh, with the price of oil currently below $100 uh, per barrel, this puts huge strains on the Soviet, uh, excuse me, the, the Russian, um, you know, old, old habits die hard, uh, uh, huge uh, strains on the, on, the, on the Russian oil production simply because it is very expensive to extract. Recognizing this, the Russians are now looking to uh, seek oil and natural gas elsewhere. And they're doing so up here in the Arctic region, where recently they have cut deals with ExxonMobil and with the Italian energy giant Eni to explore, to do really in the Arctic uh, regions of Russia, what we are now beginning to do in the Beaufort and Chukchi Sea, uh, north of Alaska. Russia, of course, has historically also had a, tr had a tremendous amount of nat natural gas, conventional natural gas, not shale gas, in this part, kind of the western here around the Ural Mountains, up, up around here. And it is actually a very reliable supplier of natural gas uh, to Europe, to Germany, to, to France, to, any, to anyone else who will buy it. They are a not so reliable supplier of natural gas to former Soviet republics, such, such as Ukraine. Here, the Russian attitude is, you, you left uh, Mother Russia's um, uh, fold, and we will use our uh, nat natural gas weapon uh, as a way to keep you in line. I mentioned earlier that there are uh, shale formations, potentially very promising shale formations, uh, throughout Europe. Again, Poland, France, um, Bulgaria, uh, the Czech Republic. Mr. Putin has become a greenie. Yes. Mr. Putin has decided that fracking would be absolutely terrible for the Europeans. And Gazprom, the giant Russian energy company, and the Russian government are now funding PR companies in uh, Poland, in, uh, in, in Bulgaria, in the Czech Republic, and elsewhere in an anti-fracking campaign because fracking is seen as a threat. The natural gas that Poland, for instance, has and that Ukraine has is natural gas that does not have to be imported from Russia. So this has led to a sudden greening of Mr. Putin. There's an interesting uh, historical parallel here. At the end of World War II, when Europe lay prostrate after all the slaughter that had gone on, the devastation, cities lying rubble, etc., the United States government developed something called the Marshall Plan. And we offered the Marshall Plan not only to Western Europe, but we also offered the Marshall Plan to Eastern Europe. Of course, I think many of you in here know exactly what became of the offer to Eastern Europe. The then Soviet Union said, no, we do not want an influx of capitalism to come into what would eventually become the Warsaw Pact countries. And so Moscow blocked it. Six, over 60 years later, the Russian government is essentially doing the same thing with respect to its opposition to uh, fracking in uh, Eastern Europe. It too sees this as a threat and it's handling in much the same way. That isn't to confuse uh, Mr. Putin's Russia with the old Soviet Union, but it is interesting to note that Mr. Putin, who made his career in the KGB, 
is now going back, learned a lesson from what the Soviet Union did at the end of World War II, and is applying that lesson now uh, to stop fracking uh, along uh, near the Russian border. Now, let's go from Russia down to China, because China is by no means immune to the demographic transformation that is sweeping the world. China's population is also dropping, and it is dropping rapidly. That is largely the result of the one child, one family, one child policy uh, that was instituted in 1980, and instituted quite ruthlessly, and when coupled with uh, a, a tradition that in China that actually pre predates communist rule and goes back actually too far, uh, saying that we have selective sex abortions, that is, the birth of males is considered better for a family than the birth of females. Those two developments, limiting the number of children to one per family, coupled with the abortion of female fetuses, has led to incredible distortions in the current young Chinese population. Normally, for every 100 baby girls, you have 105, roughly, baby boys. More boys are born than girls. In India, uh, which we'll come to in a minute, where uh, same uh, selected sex abortions are also somewhat uh, common, that figure is 110. In China, that figure is 117. So what you have is a disproportionate number of males to females, which is going to further, and indeed is already doing so, drive down fertility rates in China. And the economic implications of that are stark. In 2005, there were roughly 124, 125 million Chinese uh, between the ages of 19 and 30. This is the younger part of the workforce. By 2010, that figure had dropped to roughly 114. By 2015, that figure will be just under 95 million. What you're seeing is the Chinese labor force is contracting. And as that labor force contracts, the cost of labor in China will rise. Indeed, it is already doing so. The clothier Joseph A. Bank I read a few, few weeks ago, which, may, which has a lot of its men's uh, shirts and suits and what have you made in China, they're now moving on to Miramar, the former Burma, Malaysia, and elsewhere, for the simple reason that manufacturing costs in China are rising. So the Chinese demographic decline, which is well underway and well understood by the Chinese leadership, is going to greatly affect a lot of the decisions that the Chinese are going to be making in the years to come. Because the Chinese have always seen themselves, regardless of how uh, decrepit a, a, a dynasty may have been and how much decline the country may have undergone at times, they were always the biggest kid on the block, at least in terms of population. Well, that's going to change because China is going to be overtaken by India in population sometime between the year 2020 and 2025. Let's take a quick look now at China's um, energy. China um, had the Chinese leadership and this predates the, the, the communist era. It's, it has to do a lot to do with simple Chinese culture. They have what we can call an, an over-the-horizon view of strategic matters. In other words, they're not, good, they're not interested in poll numbers and uh, the uh, you know, quarterly reports or anything like that. They are vitally interested in developing China into a world-class power and are, in fact, succeeding in doing so. And if the Chinese don't have a natural resource within their, if the Chinese have a natural resource within their borders, they develop it. And if they don't have it, they acquire it elsewhere. Over the past several years, China has gone on a shopping spree throughout the world, particularly in Africa, Latin, Latin America, uh, making sure that it, 
and the industries, many of which, by the way, are state-owned, uh, will have access to the raw materials, that's rare earths, copper, oil, gas, whatever. They close deals with, um, and, uh, with, with countries throughout, throughout the world that have what they want. It's not just restricted to Africa or, or South America. More recently, uh, they're attempting to uh, take uh, uh, substantial ownership in the Canadian firm Nexon. It's a Chinese company called Canuck. And Canuck wants to, wants to take over a part of Nexon in Canada. Nexon, as it turns out, has substantial holdings in the Gulf of Mexico, which means that if that deal is approved, and it will have to meet the approval of both the government of Ottawa as well as the government of the United States, because, because the US, has, the US also has a stake in Nexon, uh, that the Chinese will then have access to the oils in the Gulf of Mexico. A fascinating development. Now, let's go back to Asia here for a moment because this is where I think an awful lot of the geopolitical, uh, an awful lot of geopolitical developments are going to be centralized in the years ahead. And let's look at a couple of other countries. Japan. Now, Japan is, as we all know, not an energy producer. Uh, it must import all of its, uh, almost all of its, uh, of its energy. And Japan is a country undergoing also dramatic demographic decline. Unlike so many other countries, at the end of World War II, Japan never had a baby boom. So they were not able to remotely make up what they had lost in the war. Tiny families in Japan now have become the rule. And Japan is now, like China and like Russia, and like so many other countries of the world, a rapidly aging society. The government in Tokyo estimates that Japan will lose one million people per year in population between now and 2060. For all practical purposes, the Japan of the mid-century is going to be a nation of pensioners. The Japanese are acutely aware of the decline and they are relatively powerless to do anything about it. Japan, a few years ago, made elaborate plans to modernize its navy. Japan's a highly sophisticated society, splendid technology everywhere you look, and so they were very interested in investing heavily in the navy and indeed began to do so. But they have a problem. They have so few young people that they're having trouble finding enough people to serve on crews of the ships that they're building. That is how acute it is becoming in Japan. This, of course, has not gone unnoticed in China, which has numerous disputes with Japan, and we're going to get to a couple of them. we get to one major one here in a moment. Let's now move to India, because here things are a bit different. India is a developing country still, though developing quite rapidly. So India still has a birth rate that is rising, rising so much that, as I pointed out a few minutes ago, India is going to become the most populous country in the world in the next, oh, anywhere from, from 10, 10 to 12 years. India has substantial natural resources of its own here in, along here in the western coast of India, uh, substantial offshore uh, natural gas deposits. We now think there's also plenty of, of oil deposits off here. In the eastern part of India, the northeastern part of India over here, India has an enormous amount of coal. So what India has is still a dynamic population growth. It has natural resources that it is only now beginning to bring under its control. Exactly how much of there, particularly with respect to the oil and natural gas off the Indian coast, is not known. But that's nothing unusual. It always turns out that there's, it almost always turns out there's, there's, there's more than anybody expects. That was true of the Bakken Shale. It's probably also true of, um, of, of, what, of what is lying off the, off the coast of India. The important thing to bear in mind here is how does China view this? The Chinese are convinced, rightly or wrongly, that the United States is in a terminable decline. They see the biggest threat to their security in the years and decades to come, not in the United States, but in India. 
And it is that dynamic that could make things very interesting in the years to come. The Chinese aware that they're not going to be the most populous country in the world, and they are situated close to a country that will be the most populous country in the world and will not be the economic basket case that, that it was for many, for the, in, the, in the initial decades uh, after achieving, achieving independence and 1948. So um, for, for, the, for the Chinese, this poses some very interesting questions. The Chinese are absolutely determined to get uh, at the natural, at, at, at oil and gas resources to keep their economy going. At the same time, they have to look ever more closely over their shoulder at what India is doing. Now let's look at two or three flashpoints in the Far East that bear directly on energy and, uh, and, the, and the global security situation. One is the South China Sea, which is over about, about here. Uh, something, there's a little group of islands there called the Spratly Islands. They lie east of Vietnam, west of the Philippines, and south of China. They have been, historically been used as uh, fishing grounds, mostly by the Filipinos. The islands are jointly claimed by all three countries, China is now making unmistakable signs that it views the Spratly Islands as its territory and that it will handle accordingly. What's important about the Spratly Islands? Not the fishing grounds, as nice as they are, but it is, it is suspected, indeed known by, by, by geologists, that there's a tremendous amount of oil and natural gas there. So this is another source of, of, of energy for China uh, for the years to come and they are making very unmistakable signs that they, that, that they view that particular area as their reservoir. This is the reason why the Vietnamese government welcomed with open arms uh, Defense Secretary Leon Panetta in Cameron Bay, which was the old American uh, uh, military base, naval base in, in the former South Vietnam. The Vietnamese are absolutely powerless to do anything against the Chinese. They have no navy worthy of the name, and they know it. The Chinese, on the other hand, do have a navy worthy of the name. The Philippines are in a similar situation. Their navy amounts a little more than, than that of a glorified Coast Guard, and perhaps the word glorified is, is, is too nice. Be that as it may, this is a potential, potential trouble point here because of our longstanding relationship with the Philippines. The United States does not want to get involved in this, but it is a potential flashpoint driven by energy concerns uh, that is going to play itself out one way or another in the years to come. Now let's move over here to the South China Sea, or oh, excuse me, yes, yes, the South China, the East China Sea, excuse me, over here. There, there's a group of islands called the Sinkalo Islands, which are claimed by both Japan and China, the Chinese have their own name for it, which are interestingly enough, privately owned. But they're privately owned by a gentleman in Tokyo who is not going to give them up. Like the Spratly uh, Islands in the South China Sea, the Sinkalo Islands in the East China Sea have historically been fishing grounds, but are known to have substantial oil and natural gas deposits around them. Tokyo is not going to give them up, or says it's not, and Beijing is not going to give up its claim to that, to those islands. What makes it somewhat troublesome for the United States is that we have a mutual defense treaty uh, with Japan, and according to the State Department in 2010, Japanese possession of the Sinkalu uh, Islands is covered under that mutual security treaty, meaning that should it come to a clash of arms uh, between China and Japan in one form or another, he says the United States could find itself, which it really doesn't want to do, but it could find itself involved in that. So this is something that's energy related, that is geopolitical related, that is potentially quite dangerous. 
One other area that's going to be quite fascinating to keep a look at is down about here. That's the Strait of Malacca. It's the world's busiest ship shipping lanes. It lies between the uh, Indonesian island of Sumatra and the, and the Malay Peninsula. 50,000 ships pass through the Strait of Malacca every year, many of them carrying oil uh, and other goods to China. The rise of India, which now has the world's fifth largest navy, means that there is potential conflict here between India and China because the, the Strait of Malacca is a potential choking point. So should there at some point or another become, uh, come to a conflict between India and China, and there are plenty of reasons to believe that that conflict could come about, the, the Strait of Malacca could become a flashpoint well deserving of our attention. By the way, this one matter between India and China that's up here along the border about here. There's absolutely nothing that we know of to do, do with energy, but there's a border dispute here, roughly 34,000 square miles, roughly the size of the state of South Carolina, are claimed by both India and China. Uh, both sides have reinforced the area militarily. Uh, there was actually a shooting war there in the early 1960s. Uh, there, the potential for trouble is also there. So just to sum up <coughs> uh, the four major powers of the Far East in terms of both their energy potential, their demographic decline, or, with the exception of India, and uh, the geopolitical uh, implications that flow therefrom, we have a declining Russia. It wouldn't, for instance, surprise me that <clears throat> if Russia's territory, like its population, began to shrink. Let me, <laughs> you see Mongolia right here. Just to the east of Mongolia, Chinese from the, these three northern provinces here have, have been migrating to Russia since roughly 1990. The number of Chinese who have migrated to the Russian Far East, they're, they're long here, <coughs> is not known, but is generally estimated at around 500,000, and they are still coming. The Russians know that they're there, uh, some of them come legally, some of them come illegally. That may sound familiar. But, <laughs> but be that as it may, they have established communities there. Uh, so many of them are engaged, actually, in the extraction of oil the, in, 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 uh, in, in the Russia, Russian Far East. The area in which they have moved over here once belonged to China. China lost these in what were known in two treaties, known as the Unequal Treaties of 1858 and 1860. Now, if you're a civilization as old as China, you've been around for 5,000 years, some territory lost a mere 150 years ago is nothing. The Chinese have never recognized the loss of these areas. They have signed no treaty uh, since they, they, have, they have never done, in fact, there are, even, there are even maps that you can find in China showing uh, that the, these areas in the Russian Far East belong to China. It would not surprise me if over the course of the next decades, given this enormous human vacuum that has arisen in the Far East, there are practically no Russians living there, that the Chinese gradually take over. The Russians, by the way, are utterly powerless to do anything about this. Now, they simply don't have the manpower to guard the border. They have other problems to worry about, and they, are, have, they have absolutely no interest whatsoever in escalating any kind of a conflict with the Chinese over this. It's all kind of reminiscent, if you think about it, how the Roman Empire was gradually taken over by, by non-Romans. The Russians could find themselves in the same kind of situation wherein over time they gradually, and more or less peaceably, simply lose control over territory that has been theirs now, in some cases, for well over a century and a half. I could easily imagine that sometime in the second half of the 20th century, Russia will be restricted to an area more or less, maybe the eastern boundary would be the Ural Mountains, or perhaps a little bit more, more to the east. 
it's quite possible that Russia will lose all of that. That's all, that's all speculation. But it does show uh, that population matters, that demography is important. And these are the kinds of things that we're going to have to keep a very, very close eye on because they will affect directly, they will bear directly on our position in the world. Very briefly, let's go now to uh, the Middle East, which for decades has been the, the leading area of oil production in the world. Now, there's still plenty of oil in Saudi Arabia and Kuwait and Iraq and Iran. And they're going to be exporting that oil for a long, long time. But their dominant position is, 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 is going away. It wouldn't surprise me if OPEC perhaps continues to exist pro forma. And there will be meetings and declarations and what have you. But given the, relatively, the relative wide dispersal of new things of oil, uh, in the United States, in Canada, perhaps in South America and Africa, which we're going to come to in a minute, uh, I think you will begin to see, and indeed are already seeing, the decline of OPEC. And that, in turn, could lead to a whole new regime for the pricing of oil and how all of this is, is to be done in the years to come. Let's do quickly go to Africa. And here we want to differentiate between North Africa, it's north of the, of the, uh, of the Sahara, uh, the Maghreb, and Sub-Saharan Africa here. It, is in sub it was in Sub-Saharan Africa, black, uh, or, or Black Africa, where energy-related developments and natural resources-related developments are taking center stage. It turns out that the dark continent is a wash in natural resources of almost every description. They range from diamonds to rare earths to other metals and substantial amounts of oil, particularly along here, the West African coast and here. More recently also, oil has been discovered and natural gas has been discovered uh, in Eastern Africa. What is happening to Africa, as chaotic as the political systems there may be, uh, the ethnic strife there will, will go on from now until kingdom come, in part because that's just, you know, think, think, of, think, of the, think of Africa as the Balkans on steroids. And, and, and you're, you're going to have all sorts of unrest and uh, ethnic, ethnic clashes here. The difference, I think, between uh, what has happened in the past and what is happening now is, now there's something really worth fighting over because the riches that the continent contains are absolutely enormous. The Chinese <coughs> have noticed this. The Chinese investment in Africa has been absolutely tremendous. Uh, other countries are getting, getting into the act. And um, what you're seeing now in Africa is the rise of sub-Saharan Af Africa as a major, not only energy force and natural resources force, but ultimately, I think, and this is going to take a while, as a major economic force. That is going parallel, interesting, with another development that nobody's paying, in my view, the proper attention to, and that is the spread of Christianity throughout Sub-Saharan Africa. Now, this is in part in reaction to the, uh, the, the various conflicts that have arisen between Muslims and non-Muslims, be they Christians or some, some other uh, uh, faith, atavistic faith, faith in, in, in Africa. But Christianity is actually spreading in Africa. Also spreading in Africa is the rise of the African middle class because the extraction of natural resources, again, diamonds, uh, oil, what have you, that, that is finally reaching into the African population. So you're going to see an Africa uh, that is going to become an increasingly important political force in the world Birth rates in Africa, in Southern Africa, are still at developing country uh, uh, relate, uh, levels so that you don't have the kind of demographic decline there that you have in the other countries I have, uh, I have mentioned. Now, let's come back to the one country whose demographics I have, the one major country, whose demographics I have not yet mentioned. 
and that is the United States. Because the United States here, in terms of an industrial country, is an exception. It is a huge demographic exception. The United States birth rate is actually slightly above replacement level and shows no signs of decline. Now, that varies from race to race and from ethnic group to ethnic group, but the differences aren't as big as, as you might think. And combined with immigration, which, which the United States still has, it attracts people, the United States is not going to undergo the demographic decline, or at least shows absolutely no signs of undergoing the demographic decline that is gripping Russia, China, Japan, huge swaths of, of South America and in Europe. On the contrary, our population is going to grow. And this sets the United States, as I said, apart from what is going on in other parts of the world. Before I move on, I want to make a parenthetical remark here about the demographic decline that you see around the world. Now, if this continues, and if these net mortality societies continue to spread, what, we, what, what will happen? Think, think, of, think of someone who grows up in Europe, or in Japan, or in Korea, or Russia, or China, uh, or in Latin America. 40 or 50 years from now, this person will grow up in a world of no brothers, no sisters, no cousins, no aunts, no uncles, no, not even the concept of what an extended family is. It doesn't sound like a very appealing world to me. Most of us in this room will mercifully uh, never see that. But um, that is going to be the norm because the small family has now become the norm throughout the world. The small, or for that matter, either the one-child family or in many cases the no-child family has become the norm throughout the world. Again, the United States is a big exception here. We actually have children in this country. Yes, yeah. Um, and we have, in some cases, lots of them. And the United States is going to continue to be a dynamic country, at least with respect to its demographic trends. And I think that, too, uh, has huge implications for our place in the world in the years to come. Now. Let me come back to the future of U.S. energy, which is where I started. If you look at all the trends going on in the world today, the, the demographic trends that I mentioned, we didn't even get into the, all the turmoil that's going on in the Islamic world. But there is one statement I think we can make. The biggest threat to American energy independence does not come from Mr. Putin's Russia, it doesn't come from China. It doesn't come from some, some Islamic terrorist. The biggest threat to American energy independence comes from, the United, comes from within the United States itself. And that threat comes from the US Environmental Protection Agency and the environmental groups who are in league with the US EPA. To them, the shale revolution is an absolute nightmare. It is a black swan. The black swan, I'm sure most of you are familiar with the concept of the black swan. It is the unexpected event that suddenly comes along that changes things radically. And the environmental movement was caught napping. It had targeted the fossil fuels uh, almost a quarter of a century ago as being the quote unquote cause for global warming and was having some success in demonizing fossil fuels in the public's mind. No, it wasn't able to get a cap and trade. It wasn't get the United States able to uh, ratify the Kyoto Protocol. No, it wasn't able to get uh, <clears throat> Congress to, to enact a cap and trade legislation, but the Obama administration went around that and is now doing it administratively, what it was unable to do legislatively. But what it didn't anticipate was the, the shale revolution and the rise of uh, energy sources within the United States, which occur outside the regulatory jurisdiction of the US Environmental Protection Agency, largely brought about not by Secretary Chu's uh, investments 
uh, in, 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 uh, in, in energy, but rather by very far-reaching decisions made by very far-reaching uh, individuals who looked at the shale and said, aha, there's oil there, there's gas there, technology is changing, I'm going to do something about it, and I am going to risk my, my capital, my, my sacred honor, however, we, however they phrased it, and <clears throat> I am going to bet the ranch on this stuff. <clears throat> and in betting the ranch, they also have won, and they have won hugely, and I would argue that the, that the United States and the people of the United States have also won hugely here, because what they have created, which is an absolute nightmare to the environmental movement, is affordable energy. Affordable energy for America's homes, affordable energy for America's businesses, and affordable energy which has the real potential to allow the United States to regain its position as a major world manufacturer. Remember, I pointed out that in China, <clears throat> you have a shrinking uh, labor force. It is going to continue to shrink. And as that labor force shrinks, the cost of doing business in China uh, will rise. Many American companies are already considering, not only considering, they're actually relocating for manufacturing facilities from China back to the U.S. because it's cheaper to manufacture it here. <coughs> now, if your goal and if your entire worldview is directed toward restricting access to energy, which is what EPA and the environmental movement uh, are ultimately all about, this is an absolute nightmare. The, big, the biggest threat in, in the immediate term would be for EPA to seize control of regulating uh, hydraulic fracturing in the United States. Currently, this is being done by state environmental agencies, and the record will show that those state environmental agencies are doing that very well. And there's a reason for all of that. Not only do the hydrology and geology differ uh, from state to state, but they also differ from within the state. The Barnett Shale in, uh, in north central Texas around Fort Worth is geologically and hydraulically vastly different uh, from the Eagle Ford Shale found, found formation in southeastern Texas. A one-size-fits-all environmental straitjacket imposed on Texas, North Dakota, Montana, Pennsylvania, and elsewhere will lead to absolute chaos. The goal from the environmental standpoint, from EPA's standpoint, is not to kill fracking altogether, but to ration fracking, but to ration these resources in much the same way that they ration the resources that we know that we have in the Gulf of Mexico, along the Atlantic coast, in Anwar, and, uh, and elsewhere. We're all the way back to the kind of energy rationing that is at the hallmark of so many of the scares that Willie Soon, for instance, mentioned this morning. The Obama administration, I would go so far as to say, is engaged in selective industrial sabotage of the coal industry. That is exactly what they're doing. They're doing it on, in, in, in the name of combating global warming. They're doing it in the name, name of lowering mercury emissions. Those are not the reasons, those are the pretext. The name of the game is, is to gain control of the industry and in the case of coal, destroy it as quickly as possible. After that, they can and will move on to natural gas. I can assure you from sources I have within the Environmental Protection Agency, the EPA is already drafting, drafting rules and regulations uh, that will impose national EPA control over fracking, probably in the second Obama term, if there is one. So that is the direction into which we are moving, and that is the real threat to America's energy security. All of the pretexts that, that they will come up with, whether it's combating global warming, and Richard Lindzen and Fred Singer are in this room along with Willie, Willie Soon and many, many other very, very courageous people have gone out uh, and stood up and said, no, the science isn't really 
there. This is scientific fraud being carried out on, on a mammoth scale, and by the way, with taxpayers' money. It has absolutely nothing to do with the climate or with mercury whatsoever, but is rather being used uh, by a self-anointed elite to gain control of the lifeblood of society, in this case, energy, so is that they and they alone will decide how that energy is to be used and the kind of lives that we are going to lead. So in summing up, you look at what is going on in the world today, and you know, there are tons of things that none of us can foresee happening that will, that will jostle this picture considerably, but there are some, some demographic trends which I think point to an absolutely uh, uh, amazing uh, uh, development that, that the world is going to have to, have, to, have to come to grips with, namely a declining population uh, throughout most of the world, but with the, again with the United States not being involved in that. If you look at our resources, coal, oil, natural gas, nuclear power, still accounts for roughly 20% of our electricity is clean, uh, is going to have some very, very great difficulty competing with natural gas in the years to come, simply given the abundance of natural gas. But it is a reliable source of energy. And actually, in my home state of Georgia, there's a, uh, a nuclear power plant that just got, uh, got underway a few months ago with, an, with another one in, 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 in the hopper. And um, when, when we occasionally, uh, from Washington politicians and others here, well, I'm for an all of the above energy strategy. We need to be very careful about that because some of the above simply don't work and they never will. Regardless of how, many, how much you subsidize corn-based ethanol, cellulosic ethanol, wind, solar, geothermal, and all the other wonderful things that, that Mr. Chu and other people love to, love to put lavish taxpayer money on, they will never have the energy density to propel an industrial society and a data-driven society such as the United States is in the 21st century. A real energy policy is, is allowing the creative genius of the American people to seize the opportunities that we have in our own natural resources, both the natural resources that are in the ground as well as the nat natural resources that are in our heads, or at least some of our heads, and, and to put those resources at the disposal of American people, to give those people, particularly in areas long deprived of, 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 of wealth over the next decades to come, and our next speaker will tell us an awful lot about that, and put those, put those resources at the disposal so that the American economy will be powered by energy, reliable, clean, and made in the USA. So the opportunity is there. But we all know from our study of history and in our own personal lives that well, opportunities can be seized, but they can also be squandered. So the choice before us today is which way will it go? The forces arrayed against us, a powerful, largely unaccountable environmental agency in Washington in league with a superbly funded environmental movement both of which, an administration in power, which, which is working hand in glove with both of the above, they will deny us that access. But they're not only denying us the access uh, to those wealth, they're also denying current and future generations of Americans access to hope to build the better lives that they all would like to enjoy. And it is a task of everyone in this room and of our many colleagues elsewhere to see to it that they don't succeed, that we succeed, and to see to it that we use our natural resources to the benefit of future generations of Americans. Thank you very much. <laughs>